Myself, Dr. Gibran Ahmad presents to Simply Pathology and today we are back with an important lecture. In the previous lecture, we had started the basics of the peripheral blood smear. Today, we are going to continue the discussion on the peripheral blood smear. Today, we are going to concentrate on the morphological evaluation of the white blood cells, platelets and the parasites. So, let us see what are the objectives for today's session. So, today we are going to learn about the morphological evaluation of the WBCs, numerical abnormalities of WBCs, differential leukocyte count, correction for NRBCs, okay, for spurious high WBC count. Then we are going to see the commonly encountered problems while evaluating the platelets and identifying normally encountered parasites, okay. So, let, let us uh, begin today's topic of discussion without wasting any more time. So, first the WBCs. So, so, as we have already seen in the previous lecture that approximate idea about the total leukocyte count can be gained from the examination of the smear under high power objective. Okay, so we have already seen this thing in the previous lecture, how we have already discussed in detail that you, we have to take an average of 4 to 5 high power fields. We have to see how many WBCs are present, okay, and we take an average, okay. You multiply that by 1500 to 200. So, that is going to give you a range, okay. You, it is going to give you a rough idea about the total leukocyte count. Now, differential leukocyte, uh, a differential leukocyte should also be carried out, okay. So, you can also carry out the DLC, okay, and we will, uh, you know, see in details how to carry out the DLC as well, okay. Any abnormal appearing white cell, okay, if you see under the 40X, if you are seeing any abnormal looking WBC, then that should be evaluated under the 100X, that is under the oil immersion objective. So, what are we considering here? While we are evaluating the morphology of the WBC, what are we considering? So, we are considering the morphology of normal leukocyte that has already been discussed in the previous lecture in detail. So, we know how a neutrophil looks like, how a basophil looks like, how a small lymphocyte, large lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, how the normal leukocytes look like because it is very important for you to understand the basic morphology of the normal leukocytes because without understanding that you cannot carry out a proper differential leukocyte count. So, this we have already done in the previous lecture. Okay. Morphology of abnormal leukocyte. This is what we are going to consider today. So, what are the abnormalities in the morphologies of leukocytes encountered while examining the PBS? That is a very important part that we will discuss today. Then the differential leukocyte count, how we carry out the DLC already in short, we have discussed in the previous lecture. Today, we are going to add some more points. And then we are also going to see the numerical abnormalities pertaining to leukocytes. Okay. So, morphology of normal leukocyte as we have already discussed in the previous uh, lecture. So, we are not going to discuss that again over here. Okay. Today, we are going to see the morphology of abnormal leukocyte. So, what are the morphologies that you see? So, when you encounter a neutrophilia, okay, when you encounter neutrophilia and along with that, if you see, if you encounter neutrophils wherein you find a lot of numerous granules, okay, violet color granules you are appreciating. Okay, so these are indicative of toxic granules. So, you can see that the neutrophils are filled. Normally, neutrophils, they contain some granules. Okay, but when you see a very coarse granule and you see that all the neutrophils have a lot of such coarse granules which are present and which are abundantly present. Okay, then you suspect the presence of toxic granules. So, these are darkly staining, bluish purple, coarse granules present in the cytoplasm of neutrophils, okay, and they are numerous, okay, so they are abundantly present inside the neutrophils and they involve all the white blood cells, okay, especially the neutrophils. So, these are basically indicative of severe bacterial infection. So, you can always give a note, okay, that toxic granules are present. So, like this note can be given. So, to give the, the treating clinician an idea about the uh, you know, the status of the patient, okay. So, neutrophils showing toxic granules are basically indicative of severe bacterial infection. Then, for example, sometimes you might see that you will see certain precursors, okay, especially the band forms can be seen, okay, the metamyelocytes form can be seen as well, okay. So, sometimes you will see a shift to the left. This is called as shift to the left, okay. You will see certain precursors of the neutrophils. So, shift to left, what is it? It refers to the presence of immature cells of the neutrophil series, mainly these band forms as you can appreciate, okay, as well as the metamyelocytes as we can appreciate or sometimes the myelocytes also, okay. 
So this is seen basically in the peripheral blood smear and this is indicative of any infectious or inflammatory disorder. So again, sometimes when you see the shift to the left, you can just mention under the WBC heading that shift to the left is present. It is again indicative of infections or inflammatory disorder and it is very commonly encountered abnormal morphology under the peripheral blood smear. Okay, after that, sometimes you can also encounter hypersegmented neutrophils, which is especially seen in megaloblastic anemia. So, what is hypersegmentation? So, hypersegmentation of neutrophil is said to be present when more than 3% of the neutrophils have 5 or more lobes, presence of more than 5% of neutrophils with 5 lobes, and one neutrophil with 6 lobes is highly specific and sensitive for megaloblastic anemia. Okay, so these are large in size. So, the neutrophils, if you see, they will be larger in size and they are also called as macropolycytes. So, they are mainly seen in folate or B12 deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency and they represent one of the earliest signs of megaloblastic anemia. Okay, so hypersegmented neutrophils are again one abnormal form. They are pointing towards an abnormal pathogenesis. Then sometimes we are also encountering atypical lymphocytes. So, remember one thing, this atypical lymphocytes, sometimes they are also written as activated lymphocytes. Sometimes they are also written as reactive lymphoid cells, okay, or reactive lymphocytes or reactive lymphoid cells, okay. So, these are mainly seen in different kinds of viral infections, especially infectious mononucleosis. So, atypical lymphocytes, what are the characteristics? If you see, they are quite large. And they are irregularly shaped lymphocytes. As you can see, the shapes are differing over here. Okay. So they have an irregular shape. Okay. And they have abundant amount of cytoplasm with an irregular nucleus. So you can see the shape of the nucleus. Okay. It is quite irregular and they have abundant amount of cytoplasm as you can appreciate over here. Now, the characteristic feature of a lymphocyte series is the presence of a deep blue basophilia. As you can see, this deep bluish tinge over here. So, deep bluish basophilic color is indicative of a lymphoid series, okay, at the edges. So, as they can see, cytoplasm is showing deep basophilia at the edges. So, you can see at this edge, a deep basophilia, at this edge, a deep basophilia can be seen and even at the scalloping of the borders, okay, can be seen. The nuclear chromatin is less dense and occasional nucleoli may also be present, okay. So, you should be careful to not interpret these atypical activated or reactive lymphoid cells as blast. It's very important to understand this feature, okay? So, atypical lymphocytes, usually they are indicative of viral infections, okay? Then comes the concept of blast, okay? Now, it is very important to understand that just by looking at morphology, okay, you can get an idea whether it is a myeloblast or a lymphoblast, but you should never, you know, be commit that whether it is a myeloid leukemia or a lymphoid or lymphoblastic leukemia. Why? Because suppose morphologically you think it is a myeloblast, but immunophenotypically it might be, you know, it, it might be acute leukemia of ambiguous lineage wherein a single cell is, is expressing both the lineages, okay? Or it might come out to be a lymphoblast. So, in that case, you will be in a legal battle or you will be under the legal dilemma. So, because of that, you should never comment okay, the nature of the blast, okay, recognition of blast can is very easy, you might write suggestive of myeloblast or suggestive of this to be confirmed by immunophenotyping or some ancillary investigation or by cytochemistry, okay, so it is very, very important, you should commit the percentage of blast which is present in the peripheral blood smear, but you should never commit whether a myeloblast is there or a lymphoblast is there, or a megakaryoblast is there just by looking at the morphology, okay, that has to be confirmed by cytochemistry or immunophenotypically or, or by immunophenotypic study. So, on the left hand side, you can appreciate, now over here, you can see that these are very large cells, okay, so they are very large cells, okay, and they have again a moderately abundant cytoplasm and multiple nucleoli can be appreciated over here, okay, also the chromatin is quite open. And very importantly, over here, you can see the presence of, of overrod, what is known as a overrod, okay. So, in this case, you can safely comment them, okay, as a case of a myeloblast, only when you can see overrod. But always remember, still you should not commit because along with the myeloblast, sometimes other blast can also be present in case of a biphenotypic uh, leukemia. So, that is why, again, even if the overrod is present, my advice to you is do not commit to which kind of blast it is, okay, because you cannot rule out a biphenotypic uh, uh, leukemia. 
again over here this is again a myeloblast okay a high nc ratio so if you compare with the size of the rbc they are very large okay and usually over here it is not depicted usually the cytoplasm will contain certain granules okay and very importantly the cytoplasm is abundant they are having multiple nucleoli can be appreciated and you can see our rod over here you can see our rod over here this is on the left hand side on the right hand side you will see a lymphoblast so a lymphoblast what is very important over here these are again larger cells as compared to as compared to the size of an rbc they are again large but as compared to the size of a myeloblast a lymphoblast is not that much you know that much large so this is basically a lymphoblast again the nc ratio is very high they are having also an open chromatin but it is slightly coarse compared to the chromatin of the myeloblast and the nucleoli is not that much visible okay nucleoli is very scant over here okay and cytoplasm is very scant you can see in comparison to the cytoplasm present in the myeloblast their cytoplasm is quite less okay they are having less lumbar of nucleoli okay and again their chromatin is not as much open as it is that in case of a myeloblast okay so these are the different kinds of blast and blast are abnormal cells which you have to identify you cannot miss a blast while examining a or reporting a peripheral blood smear so how do you differentiate between a myeloblast and a lymphoblast so the myeloblast as i have already explained they are larger lymphoblast is smaller the amount of cytoplasm is moderate in myeloblast whereas they are scanty in lymphoblast over rod may be present in myeloblast they are absent in lymphoblast nuclear chromatin is fine whereas it is coarse in case of lymphoblast okay nucleoli they are quite prominent 1 to 4 they are indistinct 0 to 1 okay so this is how you differentiate between a myeloblast and a lymphoblast Again, one very important point of difference, okay, between a lymphoblast and a normal lymphocyte. So, sometimes you might get confused also. So, always remember the size of a normal RBC is similar to the size of the nucleus of a small lymphocyte. This is a small lymphocyte, okay. Whereas, if you look at a, this lymphoblast, again, morphologically, it is looking like a small lymphocyte only. So, sometimes you might, sometimes if you just have the entire smear is filled with lymphoblast and there are no normal lymphocytes, so in that case, you might make a mistake. So, always remember, always remember a lymphoblast when compared with the size of a normal RBC, if you see, the lymphoblast is much larger. If you see the size of a lymphoblast, the nucleus of the lymphoblast, if you see, it is far more larger compared to the size of a RBC, okay. So, this is how you have to differentiate between a lymphoblast and a small lymphocyte. Why? Because the nuclear features are not that much, uh, you know, helpful in distinguishing between a small lymphocyte and a lymphoblast. So, size is very important to differentiate and you can do this by comparing with the size of the nearby RBC. Okay. So, this is how you discuss about the different blast. Now, the different kinds of other cells that you will see is sometimes you come across what is known as pelger huet cell. So, what is a pelger huet anomaly? So, very importantly, pelger huet anomaly, it is a benign autosomal dominant condition where there is a failure of nuclear segmentation of the granulocyte so that the nuclei, they look rod-like. So, we can appreciate a WBC over here, which is having a rod-like nucleus. Okay. So, basically, uh, in case of a neutrophil, normally there is a segmentation of the nucleus, but in this disorder, the segmentation fails. So, sometimes you will see rod-like nucleus over here. Sometimes you might also see that there are only two segments, okay, and they are connected by a thin uh, thin strand of chromatin, okay. This is a pelger huet anomaly and this is a true anomaly that you appreciate. Again, over here, you can see the rod form. Again, you can see the hyposegmentation over here. So, usually this condition is a pelger huet anomaly. It is a benign autosomal dominant condition and clinically it is not significant. So, many a times you will come across this, okay. But always remember that such granulocytes are also observed in myeloproliferative disorders like MDS that is myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia. So, such changes when you see, okay, in some serious disorders like MDS and AML, then they are called as pseudo uh, pelger huet cells. They are called as pseudo pelger huet cells. Now, always remember if you are, if you are examining a peripheral blood smear and you are coming across such cells. So, you go and see whether any other abnormal cells are present or no. You see whether any cytopenias are present or no. You see the counter reports. You see the counter uh, evaluation. You see the WBC count. You see the RBC count. You see the platelet count. If you see that everything is normal, then basically this, these are pelger huet cells and they are not clinically significant. But if cytopenias are present, 
if you see such abnormalities if you see abnormalities involving other series also if you see hypogranularity then you think in terms of myelodysplastic syndrome if you see success along with this you are also finding myeloblast then you think in terms of um, acute myeloid leukemia okay else else if everything is all right then these cells you may normally encounter and it is nothing you know serious okay so always remember this point very importantly so a pbs examination is always giving you an idea about how to go for further investigation okay okay now sometimes you might also see in the neutrophils there are multiple cytoplasmic vacuoles that you can appreciate over here okay so vacuoles in neutrophils are indicative of active phagocytosis and they are seen in case of bacterial infection so there is a high correlation of this finding in, uh, with septicemia okay okay then again what are the other abnormalities morphological abnormalities that you come across on the day to day activity so sometimes you also see some kind of a mature b cell leukemia that is cll that is chronic lymphocytic leukemia okay so over here you will see that an elderly patient so the uh, age of the patient will be an elderly patient okay and you will see multiple mature small lymphocytes over here you see multiple mature small lymphocytes over here and the count is usually a little bit higher and the percentage of these small lymphocytes are high and you see also the presence of what is known as smudge cells okay these are what is known as smudge cells okay so basically these are indicative of a chronic lymphoproliferative disorder you do not write chronic lymphocytic leukemia you just write chronic lymphoproliferative disorder so the peripheral blood over here in this case is flooded with small lymphocytes with condensed chromatin and scant cytoplasm and these are the mature small lymphocytes okay but these are a monoclonal lesion called as chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia okay so over here the peripheral blood is is flooded with small lymphocytes with condensed chromatin and scant cytoplasm very much like small lymphocyte a characteristic present uh, finding is the presence of disrupted tumor cells that is the smudge cells so you can see these are the smudge cells which will help you to make a diagnosis two of which are present in this smear as we can see now a coexistent autoimmune hemolytic anemia explains the presence of spirocytes now in this condition also you can see the presence of spirocytes now how you differentiate spirocytes from a normal rbc we will discuss in details under the section of morphology of rbc so over here i am just showing you these are the spirocytes okay and these are the normal rbcs which are having central pallor they are normal rbcs which are smaller and not having a central pallor they are microspirocytes okay so very important now a nucleated uh, a nucleated rbc over here this is the nrbc a nucleated rbc is also present over here as we can appreciate so very importantly what we have to understand that this is also one of the cases that you might commonly encounter while examining a pbs in your lab okay so always remember about cll so in cll always see whether the patient is an elderly patient okay whether the count is high sometimes the count is to the tune of 70 80 000 but always it is not true okay but very uh, but always remember the the amount of these cells should be more than 5000 okay and you and you have to see that the percentage of these small lymphocytes are very high okay in case of an elderly patient they require further evaluation so you can leave the report as suggestive of chronic lymphoproliferative disorder then you have to carry out further immunophenotyping or you have to do the clonality study to have to confirm the monoclonal nature of the disease okay 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 then as i told you sometimes you will also see what is known as hypogranular this is a neutrophil which is hypogranular now over here you can see that the platelet count is also reduced in the background so there is cytopenia and the neutrophils again they are having a pelger huet anomaly but over here in this case very importantly there are other findings which are suggestive of myelodysplastic syndrome for example a hypogranular neutrophil normally all the cells of the myeloid series are containing granules but over here you do not see any granules and again cytopenias are also there in the background so with the overall picture okay such a case will be designated as myelodysplastic syndrome okay and occasional cases of aml might show you hypogranular neutrophils okay so always remember in the peripheral blood smear you get an idea okay of what might the patient have but it is never confirmatory so it is always safe to write the report as suggestive of and to be followed up with ancillary investigation for confirmation of diagnosis again sometimes we see dole bodies which are seen in the periphery of the cytoplasm so these are very light okay rounded bluish masses that you see in the periphery of the neutrophils so these are small oval pale blue cytoplasmic inclusions present in the periphery of neutrophils and again these dole body inclusions represents the remnants of ribosomes and rough endoplasmic reticulum they are often associated with toxic granules and are seen in case of bacterial infections okay okay 
So with this, we have completed the morphological evaluation of the WBCs and I hope you have understood in details about this. Okay. Next, we are going to discuss about the differential leukocyte count. So the differential leukocyte count refers to the relative proportion of different leukocytes which is expressed as a percentage. This is what the differential leukocyte count is. Now the leukocytes, they are counted on a blood smear and the percentage of each type of leukocyte is recorded. So you have a counter. Okay. Usually, it in, in case of a peripheral blood smear, you should uh, calculate, uh, you should count at least 200 cells and carry out a differential leukocyte count. So, the uses of differential leukocyte count is to support the diagnosis of infections, inflammation and allergic disorders, okay, and also in the diagnosis of malignant blood, blood disorders, okay. So very importantly, you have already seen this particular image. I will be repeating it once again. So using a high power objective, the leukocyte should be classified and counted moving from one field to another as is shown over here. Okay. So the area that you should uh, use for examining the blood cell should not be at the complete tail end. This is the area where we call it as there is a feathering effect. Okay. There is feathering. Okay. A little bit inside from the tail. In the tail end only you have to examine, but a little bit inside, okay, you should examine in this particular area. Okay. Morphology is best evaluated in this particular area. Okay. Now, while you are counting, you should go in a systematic way. So you can start from here. Okay. You can go in a Z pattern like this over here. Okay. Also, if you do not want to go in this fashion, you can also go in this particular fashion. So it is all right. Okay. But what is very important is the area. Okay. So the differential leukocyte count should not be carried out on the edges and in the tail of the film. Okay, so always remember you should not carry the differential diagnosis in these areas. So these are areas where the DLC should not be done. Okay, so in the tail area you have to see, but a little bit, a little bit towards the inner aspect. This is the ideal area for evaluation. Now in a badly spread smear, the polymorphonuclear neutrophils, monocytes, and abnormal cells they tend to accumulate in the feather edge. So this area actually it is called as the feather edge. Okay, this is the feather edge area. So if it is a very badly prepared smear, then all these neutrophils, monocytes and abnormal cells, they will tend to concentrate over here. Okay, as well as the lateral edges and therefore their count might be abnormally high. Okay, whereas the lymphocytes will accumulate in the body. Lymphocytes, they tend to accumulate over here in the body. Also cells in the body of the smear. Also why this area is not used because in this area, the the, all the cells are shrunken in size and they are darkly stained. So DLC on such a smear will not be representative. Okay, if the count is high and abnormal cells are present, it should be done in an area just before the tail of the film. Okay, so in this area that, that is designated. So over here in this area, you have to carry out the differential leukocyte count. This is because the morphology is best appreciated in this particular area. Okay, okay. So what is the normal differential leukocyte count range? So the neutrophils are in the range of 40 to 75 percent. Lymphocytes normally in case of adults are in the range of 20 to 40 percent. In children between four months to four years of age, the percentage of lymphocytes is more as compared to the neutrophils. This is called as inverted differential in children. The monocyte percentage is 2 to 10 percent. So it is absolutely normal to, uh, to you know, label the monocyte percentage as 8 percent, 9 percent or even 10 percent. That is normal. So I have seen students, okay, that, you know, that they, they fear and they, you know, there is a wrong uh, idea in their mind that the monocyte range is between 2 to 4 percent. No, it is 2 to 10 percent. The eosinophil range between 1 to 6 percent and basophils range between 0 to 1 percent. Now, having said that, always remember when you are using the term neutrophilia or lymphocytosis or monocytosis, it does not mean that neutrophilia will be more than 75 percent or lymphocytosis in adults more than 40 percent there it becomes so it is not the percentage rather the absolute neutrophil count absolute lymphocyte count absolute monocyte count absolute eosinophil count that is important to label whether that particular uh, cell is increased or decreased okay so always before it is not the percentage it is the absolute neutrophil lymphocyte monocyte eosinophil and basophil count now, how do you calculate that? I will teach you in this particular video only and in the next part only we are going to discuss that in details. Okay. So, now we are going to see the numerical abnormalities of leukocytes. So, for a meaningful interpretation, absolute count of the leukocytes should be calculated. Okay. And these are obtained as follows. It is equal to the percentage of leukocyte into the total leukocyte count. So, for example, if the total leukocyte count is 10,000. Okay. 
and for example around 80 percent neutrophils are there so the absolute neutrophil count will become will become 8000 okay will become 8000 okay so this then becomes a case of a neutrophilia it then becomes a case of a neutrophilia even in a situation when the total leukocyte count is normal understand so that is why absolute leukocyte count carries more weightage now what is neutrophilia you can only say a condition as neutrophilia when the absolute neutrophil count is greater than 7500 per microliter this is termed as neutrophilia or neutrophilic leukocytosis so there are many causes i am just going to read out the causes so there is nothing to explain here so what are the conditions where you get neutrophilia acute bacterial infections conditions of tissue necrosis burns myocardial infarction acute blood loss or hemorrhage in conditions of myeloproliferative disorders or metabolic disorders like uremia gout physiological causes like extreme exercise labor pregnancy emotional stress or other conditions of poisoning drug effect malignancies okay now what is a leukamoid reaction it refers to the presence of markedly increased total leukocyte count more than 50000 per cubic millimeter with immature cells in the peripheral blood resembling chronic myeloid leukemia okay but it is occurring in non leukemic disorder so leukemic reaction is one of the differential diagnosis of cml or chronic myeloid leukemia so whenever you are coming across a very high count with presence of immature uh, myeloid precursors inside the pbs you should always rule out leukomoid reaction and that is the next topic of discussion that how to differentiate so we are discussing or laying more stress in those topics which are counter encountered you know frequently in your practice so what are the causes of leukomoid reaction so any severe bacterial infection or a severe hemorrhage or severe acute hemolysis or poisoning burns carcinoma metastatic to bone marrow all of these can cause a leukomoid reaction so how do you differentiate a leukomoid reaction from a leukemia that is the cml so clinically remember the leukomoid reaction okay they will have features of underlying disease so fever is very common so clinically they will have underlying disorder the clinical features of the underlying disorder will be evident whereas in cml usually hepatitis splenomegaly is there now examination of the blood if you see the total leukocyte count is less than 50000 in leukomoid reaction whereas it is variable and usually more than 1 lakh in case of cml the course of neutrophilia it disappears with a resolution of the underlying disease whereas this is a, having a progressive nature now evidence of infection is there you will see the presence of toxic granules or dole inclusion bodies or cytoplasmic vacuoles in leukomoid reaction whereas all these things are absent in case of a leukemia okay basophilia is absent basophilia is one very specific feature of cml okay so you will find that over here immature cells although present they are few and up to myelocyte stages present whereas very importantly in case of leukemia more immature forms like blast promyelocytes uh, myelocytes all these things will be seen whereas uh, and very importantly in case of a cml you will see there is a peak okay there is basically a neutrophil peak and there is a myelocyte peak okay myelocyte and neutrophil peak is very uh, you know suggest a highly suggestive of a cml okay Whereas in leukomoid reaction, you will see more amount of band forms or mylos, uh, you know, or, or metamylocytes like that. Okay, but blast forms are not seen in case of leukomoid reaction. Now, examination of the marrow, they will show myeloid hyperplasia. Whereas over here, increased blast and immature cells in neutrophil series and suppression of the other cells. That is, there will be suppression of RBC series, suppression of megakaryocytic lineage will be there. Clonality, if you see, they are polyclonal, whereas leukemia CML, they are monoclonal. If you look at the karyotype, there is, uh, it's of normal karyotype for leukomoid reaction, whereas they are of abnormal karyotype for leukemia. And the lab score, if you see, is high uh, in case of leukomoid reaction, whereas they are low in case of leukemia. Okay. Now we will discuss about neutropenia. So neutropenia is when the absolute neutrophil count is less than 2000 per microliter. Okay. It is graded as mild, moderate, and severe depending on the amount. So between 1000 and 2000, it is mild between 500 to 100 is moderate and between and less than 500 is severe now a granulocytosis literally means without any neutrophils but for definition it is when the count is less than 200 per microliter so what are the conditions where there is neutropenia so very important one important viva question they ask you so in which bacterial infections there is neutropenia so in majority of the bacterial infection there is neutrophilia but in case of typhoid paratyphoid miliary tuberculosis and in severe septicemia sometimes the count can go low 
in viral infections like influenza measles rubella i am infective hepatitis protozoa like malaria in malaria remember the count can drop even the platelet count sometimes drops in malaria okay overwhelming infection by any organism now hematological disorders for example okay like megaloblastic anemia aplastic anemia okay a leukemic leukemia even you can add pnh okay pnh or some forms of of your uh, hemolytic anemias like g6pd deficiency some forms not all forms okay you can see pancytopenia uh, or you, you can see a decreased neutrophil count or a pancytopenia over there okay now drugs like sometimes you will have uh, uh, idiosyncratic actions okay like analgesics antibiotics sulfonamides okay phenothiazide so these are common drugs which are not known to cause neutropenia but in a specific patient they might cause neutropenia dose related drugs like your anti cancer drugs can cause neutropenia ionizing radiations or congenital disorders are there which can cause this so these are causes because of decreased or ineffective production in the bone marrow sometimes there is an increased destruction in the peripheral blood neonatal isoimmune neutropenia sle or felty syndrome sometimes there is increased sequestration in the spleen like hypersplenism so these are all the causes of neutropenia then we have eosinophilia it refers to absolute eosinophil count greater than 600 per microliter so a percentage of more for example if you are having a percentage of 8 to 10 percent okay you are labeling labeling 8 to 10 percent of for example you have given the percentage of eosinophils as 8 percent but if you take out the absolute eosinophil count okay the count is coming for example approximately 400 cells per microliter so this is not even if the percentage is 8 percent which is more than 6 percent that is the threshold for normal levels of eosinophils yet we will not call it as eosinophilia only when the absolute eosinophil count becomes more than 600 okay then only you are going to use the term eosinophilia so it is very commonly seen in allergic disease like bronchial asthma rhinitis urticaria skin disease like eczema pemphigus dermatitis herpetiformis parasitic infections like filariasis okay then hematological disorders like chronic myeloproliferative disorders Carcinoma with necrosis, radiation therapy, lung disease like Loeffler syndromes, tropical eosinophilia, hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So, these are all the other conditions, uh, you know, where you can see eosinophilia. Now, basophilia, where is it seen? Increased numbers of basophils in the blood is when it is more than 100 per microliter. It occurs mainly in case of CML. Can also be seen in polycythemia vera or idiopathic myelofibrosis, basophilic leukemia, myxedema, hypersensitivity to food or drugs. Basophilic granules they stain positive with toledine blue. Okay. Now monocytosis. Now this is described as an increase in absolute monocyte count above 1000 per microliter. The causes being infections like TB, recovery from neutropenia, autoimmune disorders, hematological disease like monocytic leukemia, myeloproliferative disorder, M4, M5 leukemias, or other conditions like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, sarcoidosis might also show monocytosis. Lymphocytosis, this is an increase in absolute lymphocyte count above the upper limit of normal for age. Okay, so normal for age. For example, the cutoff for adults is 4000. So, if it is absolute count more than 4000 in adults is lymphocytosis. But the uh, threshold has been increased for adolescents. It is 7200 and for children and infants it is 9000. Okay, so the cutoff is increased as the age is going down. So, you can call lymphocytosis in adults when the Absolute lymphocyte count is more than 4000, for adolescents more than 7200 and for infants and children more than 9000. Now the causes being viral infections everyone knows so that this question over here is which bacterial infection causes lymphocytosis. So the answer will be pertussis and tuberculosis. Protozoal infection like toxoplasmosis, hematological disorders like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia multiple myeloma or lymphoma all of these can also cause lymphocytosis others like serum sickness post vaccination or drug reactions can also lead to lymphocytosis okay okay now sometimes while you are you know while uh, you are calculating the wbc count sometimes you will see that the peripheral blood smear is containing a lot of nucleated rbcs or nrbcs now how do you differentiate an nrbc from a lymphocyte now always remember for comparison i have given so this is basically a small lymphocyte and all of these these are nucleated rbcs okay so very very important when you find that at least when you have seen that there are more than 10 nrbcs in a peripheral blood you have encountered so in that case you should give a corrected wbc count because whatever wbc count has been given by the machine 
that is spuriously high, that is wrongly high or that is falsely high. So, presence of NRBCs will give spuriously high WBC count, okay. So, these are all NRBCs. So, what is the formula for calculating? So, whatever machine count has been given, the total leukocyte count, whatever is given by the machine, you should multiply it by 100, divide by 100 plus number of NRBCs that you see, number of NRBCs per 100 WBCs that you have seen. So, for example, if the machine count was 15,000 and for example, over here you have seen approximately 50 NRBCs, okay, per 100 WBC. So, the corrected WBC count, if you see the corrected count will be what? Corrected count is total leukocyte count that is given by the machine into 100 divided by 100 plus, okay, 50 because 50, we are having 50 NRBCs plus 100. So, basically it will come out to be 10,000. So, this is basically the corrected, this is basically the corrected WBC count, okay. So, over here because of the excess, the excessive amount of WBC was mistaken, okay. Uh, for uh, the NRBCs were mistaken for WBCs by the machine. That is why you have got a falsely high WBC count. So, you have to give a corrected count for the same and I have shown you with the help of formula. So, very important NRBCs, they give spurious WBC count. So, you look at the total leukocyte count, okay. Always remember when there are 10 or more NRBCs, then you should make correction. So, what is the formula? As I told you, the uncorrected total leukocyte count given by the machine multiplied by 100 divided by 100 plus the number of NRBCs that you see per 100 WBC and I have given you with the help of example, how do you calculate the same. Now, we are going to discuss about the platelets in details.